Masechet Baba Batra, Dafnun Zayin. We are going to discuss the end of the Mishnah. We're talking about making a, claiming a chazaka. I was on your land for three years and you didn't say anything, you didn't protest, and I bought it from you. So three years, uh, that establishes a presumption of ownership. However, one has to have proof. You have to have two witnesses that you were there and consuming from the land for three years. Now, in an ideal, simple case, you have two witnesses that saw you all three years consuming from the land. However, um, a little bit more complicated is if you have one set of witnesses for the first year, another two witnesses for the second year, another two witnesses for the third year. That's okay too. They can combine together uh, because they're talking about different times. Not They're not um, uh, witnessing different things at the same time, which would be a problem, but different times which can combine together. Now, the extra complication that we're dealing with now is Shiloshachin ve'echad mistaref imahen hare'elu shalosh aiduyot ve'hen aidut achat lehazama. Let's say you have three brothers and one other unrelated person. And so for the first year, you have one of the brothers testifies with, together with that other person that you uh, consumed the field for the year one. And then the second brother uh, testifies about year two along with that same other guy. And then year three, a third brother. So what do we do in this case? You see, two brothers cannot be witnesses together. So if they had two brothers testifying about the same year, that would certainly be a problem. Uh, that would not be valid testimony. But in this case, for each year, the, one of the brothers is joining up with someone who's not related. And therefore, these are considered three valid testimonies. And you can put them together, just like you would uh, six totally different people not related. Here also, you can put them together. And even though two brothers cannot be witnesses for the same year together, but they can be witnesses for different years, that's totally fine. And so if they do that and they're found to be uh, truthful, then that can create a chazaka. And uh, by the same token, if they are found to be a dimizimin, that they, are, um, uh, that they were, weren't there, um, that they were in a different country and could not have seen it um, at that time, uh, then they will collectively have to pay for what they wanted to extract, like or any edim zomimin. And so in this case, if the field was uh, $1 million that this guy who's squatting is trying to claim, and it turns out that these four people uh, were not there and could not have testified about it, then the one guy who's unrelated, who testifies for all three years, has to pay half, and the three brothers collectively have to pay half, which means one sixth each. Uh, so this is going to this ratio is going to be important, and in, in as we in the discussion, the fact that the three brothers together uh, are responsible for half of the testimony, one for each year, and the other guy is responsible for half. Um, note that. They only have to pay if all of them become edim zomimin. Let's say only one or two of them become edim zomimin, then they don't have to pay. They don't have to pay unless the entirety of the testimony that would have extracted money turns out to be uh, not only false, but also that they weren't there and could not have been there, then they all have to pay. Now we analyze. Now this is a totally different case that we're going to compare to that case. There was a document and two witnesses signed on the document. Now it came time to ratify the document. You can ratify the document in various ways. The person who signed the document, if they're alive, they can come and say, yes, I signed that. That's one way. Uh, or um, we can, the Betin can compare signatures or um, two other witnesses who are who recognize the signature can come and say, we recognize this is that person's signature. Okay, various ways. Now, in this case, one of the two signatories died. So we can't ask him anymore to ratify his own sign uh, signature. So now the one that's alive, he testifies about his own signature. Fine, that's my signature, that's good. Now for the other one, we get the brother of the signatory who's alive, plus another person who's unrelated. And they together testified about the signature of the dead witness. And so this potentially is a problem because you have um, 
two brothers that are um, uh, that are joining together to testify about this uh, this document. So if you look at it all as one document, there's two brothers that are joining together. It's a problem. On the other hand, maybe we could look at it separately. One brother is talking about one signature, his own, and the other brother is testifying about the other signature. And so maybe we can consider them that they're talking about two separate things. And therefore, it's okay. And Sudavina so wanted to permit this case, and he said it's the same as in our Mishnah, where you have three brothers and one other person. And in our Mishnah, they do join together. They're considered three separate uh, testimonies, one for year one, that's fine, a brother, and a, 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 a non-related person. That's, uh, they're, they're not related to each other. And the second year, doesn't matter. He's related to the brother of the first year because he's testifying only about the second year. And so just like in our Mishnah, you can join together the three years, even though they're brothers, because each one is testifying about a separate year. So too, Ravina says, uh, here we have the two brothers, but they're each testifying about a different signature. And therefore, we can accept each one separately, and then we can join it together to ratify the document. That's what he wanted to say. However, Rav Asher tells Ravina, are these cases the same? They are not the same. There, meaning in our Mishnah, you are not removing the property less a quarter of its value. In other words, you're not removing three quarters of the property on the basis of the mouth of the brothers, of the testimony of the brothers. Whereas here, in the case of the document that they're ratifying the signatures, you are removing property, three quarters of the property, based on the mouth, based on the testimony of the brothers. In other words, when the Torah says you need two witnesses, yes, you need at least two witnesses. But furthermore, there's another stricture that each witness can only be responsible for half of the testimony that will cause the uh, the money to transfer or the person to be liable. So this is a problem in the case of the Shtad because um, you have one of the brothers, the one who's alive, he's testifying alone regarding his own signature. So he's responsible for 50% of that information. Uh, that we need to ratify the document. The other signature is being ratified by two people, one of which is a brother. So that's 25% of the total is being, um, is being proven by his testimony. So if we take the brothers together, we count them as one, as one unit, then they are accounting for 75% of the uh, testim testimony uh, um, total value, which is three quarters, and that's too much. It has to be half and half, and therefore they are taking too much of the burden. We can combine them because they're talking about different things. Fine, that's okay, but it has to be an, an addition that when we combine them, it's not more than 50%, which it is, and therefore their testimony cannot combine in the case of ratifying documents, whereas in the case of our Mishnah, it's it's okay, because if you add all of the brothers together, there's one brother talking about each of the years, but there's also another person who is not related. So all the brothers together account for 50% of the information that we need, and the other guy is uh, responsible for 50%. In that case, you can count them as two witnesses. You take the three brothers, they're not testifying about the same thing. So that, therefore, we can combine them. And when we combine them, all the brothers together are responsible for 50%. That is permissible. And that's the difference between these two cases. And so therefore, Rav Asher says, you cannot prove from our Mishnah that the case of the ratifying the document would be permitted. Next Mishnah. We're going to have a list of uh, actions that one does and which you can create a chazaka. Now we're talking about chazaka in the original definition of a three-year presumption of ownership. What kind of usage of a field will give you a a presumption of you of ownership if you do it for three years without any protest. So the following things work and the following things don't work. We're going to list the ones that don't work first. 
היה מעמיד בהמה בחסר, תנור דחיים וחיריים, ומגדל תרנגולים, ונותן זיבלו בחסר אינה חזקה. If, if, if I come and I put my animals in your courtyard, just a store for a while, I just put them there, or my oven, or a millstone, or a stove. If I put any of these things and I put them in your courtyard and you don't say anything, I cannot claim a chazaka. The idea is that generally people won't mind if you just put something in their yard. Not that I'm growing things or, or making a fence or anything like that. I'm just using some storage. So there's extra space in the, in the yard. A person probably won't care. That's why they don't protest. But that cannot be used as a chazaka because he didn't protest just because he doesn't care because it's a minor usage. Or similarly, if I, if I put some chickens in your courtyard and raise the chickens there, or if I store fertilizer, dung, in someone's courtyard, all these are not chazaka. They're not considered uh, um, making a major usage of the field, and people sometimes don't mind. Gimadal will talk further about exactly what the circumstances are. Aval asa mechisa libemto gaboa asara tevachim vechen, latanur vechem lakiraim vechen larechaim. Hichnis targol in toch habayit, vasa makom lezibloa amok shilosha gaboa shilosha, harezo chazaka. However, now you see why he has to have the first, this list first and then the second list, because the second list is not only am I storing these things there, I'm building something in order to store them better. So if I make a, uh, a, a partition uh, for my animals, and the partition is 10 hand breaths high, so I'm making a whole fence and I'm keeping my animals in the fence. Now I'm already building things on your field. Well, that's considered a significant uh, change to the field, a significant usage. And a normal person would protest if a stranger came and started using their, their field and started building a pen on their field, they would protest. So if the owner doesn't protest and the person uses it for three years, then that is proof of a chazaka. And so also, if he builds a partition for his oven or for his stove or for his mill, uh, or if he brings the, his chickens into the guy's house, so as opposed to being out in the field wandering around, that people may not mind. But putting him in the house, there the owner will mind. Or if a person makes an area, builds an area to put his fertilizer, either it's a hole that's three tefachim deep, or he makes an enclosure that's three tefachim high. In all these cases, that does establish a chazaka, because that's a major usage of it. All right, so I gave a simple explanation, but the Gemara wants to know further. What is the essential difference between the activities in the resha and the activities in the sefa? Both of them are using someone else's field. How come in the first one, we wouldn't expect him to protest, and the second half, we would expect him to protest, right? What's going on? We have a first answer that we're going to challenge, Amar Ula. Kol she'ilu b'nichseh ha'ger kana, b'nichseh chavero kana. Kol she'ilu b'nichseh ha'ger lo kana, b'nichseh chavero lo kana. Ula says, I can explain the principle of the Mishnah by comparing it to a principle we saw earlier. Uh, when someone wants to make an acquisition, act of acquisition, on the property of a convert who died without heirs. So this is ownerless property, first come, first serve. But you can't just go and take a, a wood from it because you want the wood. We saw the principle there that you can only make an act of acquisition on this type of property if you improve the property in some way. You have to build a gate or lock a gate or make a breach or plow the field do something that improves it, or if it was a tree, to prune the tree, then you acquire it. But just making just making usage of it, taking from it, for, uh, be taking benefit from it, that is not an act of acquisition. That's what we saw back there. And so we can use the same principle here. Anything that, uh, any action that would acquire the feel, the property of a convert, um, uh, if that works, then you can also use that to make a chazaka, a three-year chazaka, proof of uh, presumption of ownership over someone else's field where there is a previous owner. Not, not ownerless, but rather an owned field that now you claim, oh, I, I bought it from you, and this is the proof. So uh, that would be the same as what the Mishnah here says, if you build a fence around these items. So then that's like what we said about the uh, convert, that also if you build a fence around it, that's caused just doing it, making an improvement in the land, and that acquires the land, both as an act of acquisition and creating chazaka. Whereas the things that do not acquire the field of a convert, 
um, meaning just uh, taking benefit from uh, for benefiting from the field or from the tree or from whatever it is, those will not make a chazaka uh, regarding a property that is owned by someone else. And so that would mean like if I'm just storing stuff there, so that's not a chazaka. I, I could not acquire a field of a convert if I just store some stuff there. I have to improve the land in some way, and that's not improving the land. And so just like it would not acquire the field of a convert, you could not make a chazaka. That's what Ula says, and that seems like it would answer the question. The problem is that there are too many exceptions. Right? Is that a general rule? Look at these exceptions. If you, someone makes a furrow, plows a field. Now that does work to acquire the field that's ownerless of a convert because um, that's improving the field. So make doing an act of improvement, I acquire the field. However, regarding a, making a three-year chazaka for someone else, it does not work. And there's a good reason it doesn't work. If you own a field and I come and I plow it all day long, you're not going to protest because you're happy. I'm doing free labor for you. And uh, I, may, I may even be able to go and uh, you know, ask for some, um, uh, some wages for doing that. So you're not going to protest because you're getting uh, a free labor or, if anything, cheap labor. Yeah, why don't you come back and plow tomorrow also? That's why you're not. So any an act of benefiting to the field can is, does work if it's ownerless to acquire it, but does not work to make a chazaka because the owner would not protest. So you see, that's one exception to this rule. And the other way around, if going, and, going and consuming produce from the land. When it comes to making a three-year a chazaka on property that belongs to someone else, that works. If I am uh, uh, taking uh, the harvest of your field for three years straight and you don't say anything, well, why didn't you say anything? That's something you should be protesting. So that creates a chazaka. But if it's ownerless property and I go and take stuff, who's who? that doesn't mean that I meant to acquire the whole field. I'm just taking stuff. I'm not improving the field. So you see that actually these two categories are completely different. So Rav Sheshat therefore rejects Ula's distinction. So back to our question, what is the essential difference between the Resha and the Sefa in our Mishnah? El Amad of Nachman, Amad Abba, Bad Abu, Hacha, Bechasad, Ashutafin, Askinan, Debeha Amada, Kedi, La Kabde, Amehisa, Kabde. So Rav Nachman, uh, name of Rabab al Abu says, We're talking about a shared courtyard, not a regular courtyard. If you would come into my courtyard and bring animals there, I'm going to protest also regarding that. So, if it's just a regular courtyard, that's what we don't understand about the Mishnah. People are going to protest and not going to let people, someone else, come and bring your oven, bring your millstone, which you're moving your whole house and onto my property, I would not want that no matter what, whether you're building a wall or not building a wall. So how can we, what's a scenario where the distinction would make sense? He says in a share courtyard, you and I, we both have houses and we share a courtyard and entryway. Generally, the, that courtyard in the, the front yard would be used for passing through to get to the houses um, or for loading and unloading animals. It's like a temporary usage space. Um, and that, that's the normal usage. So, um, if it's talking about putting something there, uh, just like that, just for a little while, then people generally don't mind. So, if we share this courtyard and you put uh, a millstone there for a little while and I, uh, I, I, I bring my chickens out there to go around in the front yard, uh, we don't mind and therefore we didn't protest each other. That's why you cannot make a chazaka. However, if um, one of us makes a partition and puts makes a whole animal pen and puts the animals in there or makes some kind of partition around the millstone. That's like, hey, what are you doing? Why are you partitioning off a section? This is our share courtyard. There I would mind and therefore I should protest. If I don't protest for three years and you claim that I sold it to you, then we would be believed. So that's Rav Nachman's answer of a shared front courtyard. Now we ask, Now is this true that for a front yard, people don't mind? Uh, we share this yard and I don't mind if you just put your millstone there for a while. Um, that, uh, that's not true. And Mishnah Dadarim says, if we make a vow against uh, getting benefit from each other, we get into some fight and I say, I'm not going to have any benefit from you or you cannot have any benefit from me. In that case, 
we cannot even, and if, I, if I'm not going to have benefit from you, I cannot even enter into the courtyard, even though it's a shared courtyard, but because it's shared, uh, when I enter into the courtyard to get to my house, I am benefiting from your property because it's half owned by you. So if I can't even enter in, into it without your permission, and here, even if you give permission, but there's a vow. So that's considered benefiting from the other person. So generally, when there's no vow, okay, I don't mind if you pass through and just walk there. That, that's what it's for. People don't mind. But you see that if we do make a vow, then that's considered benefiting from the other person, which means each person has a right to say, hey, I would not want that. I can stop the other person from doing that because it is a shared courtyard, so I have to, I need your permission. So now, in the case where what, if one makes a vow, one is not allowed to pass through, even passing through, you see, is something that someone would be particular about uh, if, if, if they're angry at each other and they made a neder. So, all the more so, if you would go, not just pass through, but uh, put your animals there and your chickens uh, going and feeding and putting a millstone and using the millstone, I would not want that, even if it's not with a neder and we're not angry at each other, that's not something that uh, neighbors would want the other to use in their front courtyard. Front courtyards just used to pass through or, a, you know, a short, simple activity uh, like we're going to see uh, doing laundry. Okay, laundry day, you're there for a couple of hours doing laundry. That's okay, uh, but not, to, not for storage. So therefore, um, if it's a front courtyard, then it should, should be able to make a chazaka whether or not there is a wall. Just storing things in the front courtyard People normally would protest. If they don't protest, it is a neder. So that cannot be the distinction between the resha and the sefa. Ela amar av nachman amar raba bar abu. Hacha bin chava shel achore batin askinan te behamada kedi la kapte va mechisa kapte. So a second try. Here we're talking about a backyard um, of uh, that's that's shared between two neighbors. Uh, there in the backyard putting things, uh, just storing them for some time. People don't care about the backyard if you put things there, as long as they're just there wandering around. But to put a partition up in the backyard, people do care. What are you doing? Why are you taking uh, and sectioning off a, a part of the backyard uh, to put your items there? That we would not want. Okay, so that's a possible answer by Rav Nachman in the name of Rabba Bar Abu. But now another answer. Rav Papa Amar, Idi V'Idi B'Chasar Ashutafin. Rav Papa says, you know what? I can go back to the first answer of Rav Nachman. Rav Nachman uh, uh, said the name of Rabba Bar Abu, both of them. First he tried front yard, then that didn't work, so he said backyard. But now Rav Papa says, let's go back to the front yard, and I can explain that. There are some people in the front yard that are particular about the other person using it, and there are other people that are not particular. Depends, you could do a survey. So, since it's kind of up in the air, this 50-50, so when it comes to property, monetary matters, we can be lenient. And since here you put you, you brought your animals into the front yard or you brought your millstone or oven into the front yard, and so uh, would, would I be particular or not? Well, uh, some people are, some people aren't. So you know what? We're going to be lenient and assume that I don't mind. Um, and since I don't mind, that's why I didn't protest, because I because you can't assume that I would protest, therefore you cannot make a chazaka. So we'll assume that people will not will, will be okay when it comes to monetary matters, creating a chazaka is a monetary matter. But regarding neder, that's isur. Isur, that's more stringent. So we have to be machmir, we have to be stringent when it comes to that. And so, if one of us made a neder, you cannot benefit from me, then we have to assume that the person is particular and would not want the other person to use the courtyard at all, not only for storage, even for walking through. That's the difference between the two cases, and that explains the challenge we had before from the Mishnah in the Darim. Ravina gives another answer. Ravina Amar, Le'olam Lakapte, Fahamane Rabbi Eliezer, he the Tanya Rabbi Eliezer Omer, Afilu Vitur Asur Bemudar Hana'a. In fact, people don't mind other people using their uh, shared courtyard. We share a courtyard. You come in and out. You put stuff there. I put stuff there. As long as you're not building something, they don't mind. 
And that explains the difference between Resha and the Sefa. If you're not building a fence, then it's okay. If you are building a fence, then people mind. Now, what do you do with the challenge from the Mishnah and the Darim? Oh, we're following the opinion of Rabbi Eli Ezid, because he says in Abaraita that if we make a vow one against the other, then even things that we would waive the right for, to are forbidden. Even though I say, listen, I don't mind if you walk in, into their shared property. You could say you don't mind. That's, you know, it's nice to say that, but technically the person walking is benefiting from the property of the of the partner and therefore they are not permitted to go through so therefore there's a different uh, set of conditions when it comes to a vow versus when it comes to monetary property in monetary property uh, technically i could say i don't want you to put your animals there but most people don't mind and so they waive their rights so you're permitted to waive your rights when it comes to something monetary people waive their rights to putting loose things there but not to putting a fence. When it comes to a vow, it's not that it's a, it's still a little different from an apapa that says there's some people this way, some people that way. According to the Bieli Ezer, even if everybody would waive their rights and say, of course you could go walk there, but because you made a vow that the other person cannot benefit from you, your waiving of the right doesn't help any anything because the person is still uh, would be still benefiting from your property, your share of it. And that's why in the case of the Ndarim, it's prohibited. So that was another way of resolving that problem. Okay, now we get to a different uh, question of um, neighbor, uh, partners who share a courtyard, what they are definitely allowed to both use it for. So this is not an answer to the previous question, but rather uh, related in that Rabbi Yochanan says, in the name of Rabbi Yochanan, Rabbi Yochanan is an early Amora, Rabbi Yochanan is a late Tana. And so he says that the partners can stop each other from using their shared courtyard for all reasons. They say, I don't want you to use it for that. I don't want you to, to store your stuff there. Uh, however, they cannot stop each other from doing laundry in the front yard. Why? Because it's not the proper and polite way of the women of Israel to degrade themselves and do laundry in by the river or in a public area. In order to do the laundry, let's say in the river, they would have to pull up their dresses uh, so they wouldn't get wet. And then it's not Siniut that they're going to have their dresses pulled up if people would walk by and look at them. And therefore, um, it's it's proper for the woman to do the laundry in a private area, meaning in their front courtyard. And so they uh, uh, neighbors that share a courtyard have to permit each other to do laundry on that uh, private property that is surrounded by a fence, and that 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 way they can do it in private and um, uh, be modest. Okay, so that's his chidush. Ve'osem einav mereot bera. Amar Rabbi Chia bar Abba, ze she'en mistakel benashim b'sha'a shomedot ala kebisa. And now we quote a related derasha as a pasuk in Yeshaya that says, who is uh, a righteous person? Someone walks righteously, speaks uprightly. He despises gain from the oppressed. He shakes his hand from holding bribes. He closes his ears from hearing of blood, of uh, guilt. And he closes his eyes from looking at evil. So what does this mean? What, is, uh, what does that apply to? Rabbi Chia Baraba says, this is a person who does not stare at women when they are doing the, their laundry. Uh, they're going to be um, uh, pulling up their dresses and um, and uh, doing the laundry and so if someone goes and stares at them that is uh, not proper so a righteous person is someone who closes their eyes and doesn't look at something that will bring them to evil thoughts now what case what is the case exactly that these women are in some public area let's say by the river if there's another way this guy has to get to uh, whatever his grandmother's house now he's walking uh, now if there's two paths and he can go to a path where there are not women washing and he chooses purposely the path where the women are washing then you would call him an evil person you're purposely going down going there to look at these women so so not it's not that the, the pasuk doesn't apply it wouldn't apply to that pasuk says who is righteous the one who closes his eyes um well why are you going down that path in the first place right so then it's not he's not he's not called um he's not even called not righteous he's called a rasha 
Now, if there's no other way, he's got to get to his grandma's house. There's no other way to get there. This is the only way to go by the river. So then, he's uh, anus. He is, uh, his um, forced circumstances, you know, why, what, what, what is he supposed to do? So the answer is, In fact, it's talking about a case where there's no other way to go. So fine, he has to go this way. But nevertheless, he should try to uh, compel himself to avoid looking at them. Not that he has to close his eyes and bump into things, but look toward, to, look down or look towards the other side uh, in order to uh, not uh, not stare and not, not look at the, at the women who are in this uh, compromising position while they are doing laundry. So that relates to what Rabbi ben said, because he said that if you have a shared courtyard, you have to allow your neighbor to use it for laundering so that they don't have to go down to the river because that would be immodest. Now that we introduced uh, Rabbi ben we're going to cite some other um, teachings by him. Again, Biochanan, student, Rabbi ben Asked him a question. What should a garment of a Tamil Hacham look like? A Tamil Hacham should be dressed nicely, properly, to give a proper honor to what he represents as the Torah. So he should not wear sheer garments where you can see his skin, his flesh beneath it. He should wear some uh, something thick that will uh, cover him properly. Talit shel tamid hacham kesad, and that was cloak, his outer cloak. What should that look like? Kol she'en chalukon nir'em mitachtav tefach. It should be long enough so that you cannot see his skin from underneath. It should go all the way down to uh, to the floor so that you shouldn't see his legs sticking out from under his cloak. That would not be uh, proper and respectful and uh, modest dressed modest dress for a Torah scholar. Shulchan shel tamid hacham kesad. How should a uh, Torah scholar set up his table? Shene shelishe gedir ushlishi ushlish gelai ve'alav ke'arot ve'arak ve'tabato mi bachus. We can learn a lot about how people ate now from this halacha. They would have these small tables. It was more like a like a tray, like a large tray, and they would hang it up when they weren't using it. They lived in small rooms, so they didn't have a room for a whole dining room table. Then everybody sat around. Um, but this is like the trays, like on, uh, like on the, at the Pesach Seder, when you take away the table, right? You're taking away this little table. So you had a ring, and you would use that to hang it, to hang the table on the wall during the day when you're not using it. And you take it out um, during when you're eating, and you'd place it on, here it has poles or something, whatever, a rock, uh, and put it on there. So you might have uh, one or two people sitting here to eat on this table. So he says that the proper way to do it is to cover it two-thirds with a cloth and one-third leave it uh, open and on that one-third you put the the dishes uh, the vegetables and the cooked dishes the reason is because um, these uh, cooked dishes these pots were very dirty that all soot on them you know they put them in the in the oven with all the ashes there so you don't want to put the the dishes the cooked dishes are directly on the tablecloth because then you'll get it all dirty so you put that on the side However, the bread that you're going to eat, you put the bread on the tablecloth, and that way, um, people, they eat with their hands. So that way you could wipe your hands on the tablecloth um, as you take the bread and you would dip it into the uh, cooked dishes. So this would be a nice, proper, um, polite way of having table manners. This is more like a kind of a placemat um, that uh, we would use in a similar way where you put the food, the dishes uh, directly on the on the table and you have your placemat. And so in those days, if they're eating with their hands, they would use this as their main napkin. So that's a proper way to do things. And also put the ring on the outside because if you're sitting over here or over here, um, then the ring would be bumping into you and be annoying. And so put the ring on the outside. That way uh, you don't have to you don't have to deal with it. Okay, so that's the proper way to do it. Now we ask a question from a Braita. This is the opposite of a Bibana regarding the ring. As a Braita says, the ring should go on the inside where the where the diner is sitting, not on the outside of a section um, that's uh, facing out. 
So how do we resolve this? We have three answers. Lakashya had ika yenuka hadeleka yenuka. The bibena who said it should be on the outside, that's when there are children. So let's say you have an adult here and the, and the child sitting over here. So a little baby, when they see a ring, they're going to start playing with it and shaking it, moving the table, making everything fall over. So therefore, if there is a child sitting at the table, then put the ring on the outside. However, if there are no children, then put the ring on the inside. The reason is because there's going to be a waiter and the waiter is going to come and put, bring the food and he puts the food over here because there's people sitting over, around over here. And the waiter, we don't want him to bang into the ring and that'll be annoying to him. And so therefore, um, if there are no children, that's what the Benaita was talking about, put it on the inside. It's slightly annoying to the diners, but not a big deal. And that way you save the waiter from bumping into it. I like this Gemara because it brings such real life, right? Some of these details uh, really show you what life was like when they were sitting and eating. And you get this picture of this little infant that's shaking the table and the parents are like, hey, stop shaking the table. And they have to turn it around. Um, so it's just like, you know, regular daily life, like nothing changes. Anyway, that's the first answer. Or you could say both the Ben A statement and the Baraita are talking about when there are no children. And there's no problem. One is where there is a waiter and one is when, when there is not a waiter. So uh, Rabbi Ben Ahu said that you put it on the outside. That's when there's no waiter, right? They serve themselves and they put everything there. And so you put it on the outside because there's no waiter that's going to come. Whereas the Baraita that says that put the, you should put the, the ring on the inside, that's when there is a waiter. And since the, way, the waiter is coming back and forth all the time, so we don't want him to bump himself on the on the ring so put it on the inside and it's only a slight inconvenience for the diners that are sitting there third answer or maybe both sources are talking about when there is a waiter and it's not a problem once talking about in the daytime and once talking about in the nighttime in the daytime when you can see it clearly so then you could put it on the outside and the waiter will make sure to avoid it because they'll see it that's the bimana the braita this is put it on the inside that's talking about when it's at night that maybe they have a little candle or something but otherwise it's hard to see so put it on the inside so the waiter won't bang into it. So you see a Tamid Chacham thinks through all the little details to make sure that things won't go wrong, things won't spill, people won't bang into things and be annoyed. And so uh, that's the way of a Tamid Chacham to always think ahead that everything should be done just right. Veshel Ama'aris and Amadis doesn't think things through. Has he set up his table? He makes it kind of like a bonfire where you have one thing in the middle and then uh, other things surrounding it. So too, he puts his food in the middle and put, and then puts the plates all around it. But then that's not a good idea because how's the waiter going to come and, and serve it when the stuff is in the middle and the people are all around? It's going to become a huge mess. So they don't think through. They just like put it like that. But that's that really doesn't make sense to do it that way. And the last question of Rabbi Yochanan uh, that he tell us from Rabbi Benah, How should the bed of a Torah scholar be arranged? The answer is you shouldn't have anything under your bed except for sandals in the summer and regular shoes in the winter. That's the only thing they should put under your bed. But otherwise, keep it nice and clean. What, what, don't, don't, don't just stuff things under your bed. However, the bed of, a, of, a, of an ignoramus, uh, ignorant person is like a cluttered storehouse. He just stuffs things in there. He never doesn't even remember what's, the, what, what's down there. Oh, there's food and garbage and junk and doesn't keep things nice and tidy and clean. So this is all nice, good advice. Um, he started off about talking about laws of, of modesty, uh, uses of a, of a courtyard for laundry so that the woman wouldn't have to go out. And then he continued talking about other proper advice on how to have good manners. Baruch Adonai Amen Amen.